like to uh, call the uh, budget meeting uh, to order. Uh, roll call. We get all board members uh, present. Need to approve the agenda, please. So moved. Second. You got that? No. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, public comments? No public comments. So we get. Uh, we're on to our next uh, 2021 budget update. Right. I'm going to turn it over to Steve. He's sharing his screen this evening, and I'll let him walk us through the meeting tonight. Thanks, Randy. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, yep. perfect. So just for some information on the meeting, we have the facility committee meeting scheduled at 6.30. So we have 90 minutes and I'll do my best to walk through each of the agenda items in the next 90 minutes. Uh, if any of the agenda items, uh, if you wanna bring them back to a future meeting, feel free to, to mention that as we go and we can certainly do that. We're gonna start this evening with talking about the current year budget, the 2020-2021 budget. We're then gonna move into discussing next year's budget, the 2021-22 budget. And then we're gonna end the meeting talking about some future agenda items and additional topics for the next committee meeting. So the first agenda item is the projected end of the year balance. And so on this agenda item, I just want to again mention that our district purchases a data analytics program called Forecast 5. Part of the Forecast 5 pro product that we purchase is a system that allows us to estimate the end of the year fiscal balance. Uh, if you remember last month, we shared a report with you that included a projection of the end of the year funds. That included data through the end of February. Now we have data uploaded into that system through the end of March. So we're getting closer and closer to really having a good majority of the data entered into this system. Uh, so I'm gonna open up the report here and I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger so you can see it on your end. Can everybody see that or you want me to make it bigger? Uh, it's kind of blurry. If Jack needs it bigger. We can see that we can see that there are actual numbers there, Steve. We can't actually tell what any there of the numbers are. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so I want to grab this over to the far right. Just one moment. Okay, so the number in the, the columns to the far right, variances favorable or unfavorable is the estimate as to where we will be at the end of the year. So if you go all the way down and you see that 2.7 million. So as of right now, this system is estimating that we would have about $2.7 million at the end of this fiscal year unspent. So that's a pretty significant positive balance. Um, there's certainly a number of reasons why that balance is that high. And you can see the various categories that show um, the first line is an example, salaries, you see under expenditure salaries, to the far right, the system is projecting 833,000 in unspent funds on salaries. So you may ask, how is that number that large? And the main reason is positions that have not been filled. So the school board already approved a pay increase. That pay increase has been factored into that number, but it's really positions that weren't filled that haven't been uh, having expenditures against them really resulting in this large dollar amount. Another example is substitute costs. Uh, but in total, between all of the salaries, when the system estimates what'll be left at the end of the year, it's estimating 833,000 remaining for salaries. Um, the $741,000 line, um, if I go over here to the right, 
is what's called non-capital objects, supplies and materials, about 700,000 unspent. The line above that, contracted services, the main uh, factor there is the transportation costs with lamers. So again, expected 616,000 unspent. So if you go to the bottom line, about $2.7 million right now projected to be unspent by the end of this fiscal year. That's the most significant amount we've had uh, probably in the 20 years I've been working in Wanakee as far as unspent funds at the end of the fiscal year. So there's going to be a, a significant addition to our fund balance unless something else happens over the next couple of months. Uh, one of the things, if you looked at the notes, that still has to be discussed by the committee is whether or not the committee wants to make our annual contribution into our Fund 73 or our Employee Benefit Trust Fund. Typically, we, we make payments into that fund, let's say around $600,000 a year. And that payment is put into Fund 73 to pay for retirement benefits for those who have not yet retired in the district. Basically, uh, agreements that we've reached over time with various employee groups to provide people with X amount per year of service, X amount per sick day, all of that adds up and we typically make about a $600,000 payment per year to help pay for that cost. Well, that's not a requirement. It's an optional payment that we would, we would make. If we make the payment, we stay more on track with paying off our liabilities in that fund. If we don't make the payment, um, we're just deferring it to future years. That isn't, again, a decision that has to be made tonight. So if the committee wants to see next month's report to see how does that $2.7 million change, uh, you certainly can do that. We can bring next month's report back. Um, I was talking, emailing with Diane Pertzborn today. Diane uh, reminded me that we can make that payment all the way until the end of July. It would be nice if the school board or budget committee weighed in on this, uh, either at the May meeting or the June meeting so that we could, we could plan ahead. But you could even go so far as a July meeting before you have to make a decision on that. Sure. So as of right now, the end of the year balance is looking very positive. Uh, does anybody have any questions that you would like to discuss or any comments on the fund 73 piece? Steve, with the Fund 73 payback, not paying it back, does that have an effect on our rating, our bond rating, because of increased survivability on paid? Yep, so I've got at the bottom of this agenda, future right. agenda items that right. have our bond rating on there. I'm. We need to discuss our bond rating. Uh, we did learn that the new data from the new, excuse me, the new data metrics from Moody's is focused more on fund 10 fund balance and fund 10 cash balance are two huge factors for them that they viewed our district to be below average in. Uh, they do view an unfunded liability in fund 73 negatively but we have a, a decent balance in Fund 73 and have been bringing that down over the years. So I would say there's other factors, Mark, that matter quite a bit more, but it is a factor that matters. Thank you. Hey, Steve, how much do we owe the uh, village for that uh, tennis court yet? Yep, great question. So uh, the next agenda item is to ask for your feedback on, on payments to the village. So just quick jump to that. So we owed a total of $57,000 times five. So a little over $250,000. We've made two payments of $57,000 each and would have three remaining. So a question that Randy and I wanted to ask this committee is given 
uh, the projections for the end of the year balance, does this committee support just finishing the payment to the village? Or would you like us to continue on this five-year uh, option that we were negotiated with the village two years ago? Jack, I know um, you made it, you've discussed in the past trying to pay this off sooner if we could. And certainly this spring, we would have the funds to pay this off sooner if the board members uh, so were interested in, in doing. Any comments? Yeah, I need to defer to Brian for a question. What uh, does it take to enhance the custodial situation salary wise if you don't have budget there to try to address the first year step, which you said was low in a concerning part, maybe even potentially the head custodian salary range? Those are two that jumped out at us. Um, what we're working on or putting to, to the HR committee is uh, targeted improvements to custodial, uh, the custodial rate, the head custodian rate, regular paras, special ed paras, health assistant and tech assistant because they're classified the same way. Um, with, within all those uh, five, there's five groups, five classifications there. It's uh, uh, um, 191,000. Is what we're proposing. What I'm proposing, we would add to targeted improvements in those areas. And is there some place in the budget to adopt that? And the the plan is that it would be working within or, or close to the proposed wage increases, um, with perhaps needing to look a little bit outside that. Uh, because I guess what I'm thinking, and I see this thing here, it'd be nice to pay this some of it off ahead of time, but if we've got a hard time hiring people, I'd rather take that 57,000 extra payment and direct that way versus paying off the tennis courts a year early from my own perspective. I think it's be a greater application of, of resource money. What I would, this would, this would be very much a ballpark mark, but if you're using a number of about 57,000, uh, that would be probably about two, maybe a little more than that, maybe four fifths of the cost of that 191,000 would be going toward that, that money would be going towards the custodial groups and control. I think one of the things that we're looking at is, as Steve pointed out, we do have a considerably larger end of the year balance, which if we do nothing with it, it rolls into fund balance. Right. So certainly that impacts us as we start to look at bond rating and all exactly. those pieces that we have conversations about. Um, it is one-time dollars, and that's a piece that we've kind of got to look at. Is it's, it's those funds aren't aren't they need to go back into the budget in future right. years or next year, for example, into transportation, et cetera. So, so in my mind, paying off the tennis courts makes some sense to get it off of our off of our books and then we can utilize funds moving forward in a different way. But I think yeah, I agree with that. Uh, you know, getting this behind us because we do have the uh, funds. Uh, next year's budget may not be as easy as this year's budget. And uh, if we can just get that behind us, then you know we can basically use those allocated dollars, you know, for something else. So Steve, we're looking at what about 160 some thousand? Yep. And I, I would reiterate what uh, Randy's saying that if we were gonna pay this off, this would be the time to do it. It makes sense. And the it will not in any negative way impact what Brian is going to be bringing forward to the HR committee later on this week. And any funds that are carrying over from one fiscal year to the next are completely at the discretion of the board as to how you would choose to use them. Sure. And so I would view these as topics that, of course, all resources are connected, but I wouldn't want the board members to feel limited with the HR side by also paying off the tennis courts. 
sure. I certainly think both of those things are entirely doable. Okay. So do you want a motion on that? We would want the committee to make a motion to either recommend one payment or three payments uh, this before our fiscal year ends uh, regarding the tennis courts of the village of Wanakee or move it to the next month's meeting if you're not comfortable making a decision tonight. I would just do it then. Yeah. Do you have a motion? I'll make the uh, motion to uh, pay off the uh, tennis courts uh, in installment. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So we kind of jumped away from uh, fund 73. So would you be looking to see that making that $600,000 payment out of, again, with some of the 2 million plus? Yeah, so if the, yeah, if this committee want, wants to move ahead with the fund 73 payment, that would come out of that $2.7 million that was identified. My recommendation on this one is to wait until the June committee meeting we actually have a draft of our fund 73 actuarial report which identifies our outstanding liability and identifies what our annual payment should be to eventually eliminate that liability right i think it would be best if i can share the final version of that report with you in june i could update the projected end of the year balance in june and you could make a more informed decision next month with more information in front of you because there really isn't any need to make a decision tonight. I just want to keep this on your radar because it is a larger expenditure, but I would recommend that we bring this topic forward, carry it forward to the June uh, budget committee meeting if that works for the committee members. If it works. I'm good at that. Just for a point of clarification, though, Steve, we held that out as sort of an insurance for COVID expenses, correct? Absolutely, yes. That, that was, was a, that's one of our options. Absolutely. We yep. haven't touched it because we had the referendum and all the ESSER funds. Yep. So for a point of clarity, that was the reason we didn't make the payment. Yes, absolutely. So this, the payment was not made as it was a strategy, a potential strategy related to COVID-19 expenditures. And you're right, it was before the referendum was approved and before we knew about the additional ESSER funds. Okay, thank you. Is the committee okay with us bringing this back in June to explore it a little bit further? Yes, we are. Yes. Okay, perfect. Then I'll move on to discussion on building department carryover funds. So we talked about this topic last month. And as a reminder, last spring, the budget committee weighed in and recaptured some funds from the buildings and departments for events and activities that did not take place due to COVID-19. Uh, so if you recall, there were several hundred thousand dollars of resources that were captured back for district use uh, because of activities that did not take place. Last month's meeting, I asked a similar question, where do you as a committee feel we should be landing on that topic for building and department budgets at the conclusion of the 2020-2021 school year? As a committee, you asked for the administrators to share information with you as to what they would be doing with the carryover funds if you allowed them to carry over. Uh, and so each of the administrators filled out a, a Google sheet sharing information as far as what they would do with carryover funds if you provided them with that opportunity this year. So as an example, the first one was from Arboretum. Basically, you saw from uh, Sheila Wyatt that these are the items that if they had the opportunity to 
carry over funds from one fiscal year to the next, these would be the items of focus for Arboretum Elementary School. Each building and department provided you with similar information to share what they would be doing um, if this committee you know, recommends or allows them to carry funds between fiscal years. So you do have that information from each of the buildings and departments. And that kind of leads back to the larger question as a committee, are you comfortable with carrying over funds at the building department level? Are you comfortable with them carrying over 100% of the funds? Are you comfortable with them carrying over some of the funds? Uh, it's completely a decision up to you know, this committee. We're looking forward to your uh, input one way or another, and then we will share it back with you know, the members of the administrative team. Um, Randy, did you have anything you wanted to add? Just a clarifying point. In the previous slide, you talked about uh, um, what we had for a balance, the 2.7 million. How does how do these numbers, just for clarification for the committee, do they impact that 2.7? Are they part of that or are they separate from that? I would say they're separate from that in that if you could look at it from this lens, Let's say that the unspent building and department funds is $400,000 of the 2.7 million. The question is when we move into the next fiscal year, are we considering those $400,000 district funds that can be used at the district level? Or are we considering those building and department funds that would be usable for, for the, the, uh, the uh, items that you see on this list? So it just kind of depends on who would have the authority to spend those dollars. Steve, uh, so if you add this, are each of these 100% of the specific areas uh, carry over? So, they, so Sheila's, for example, this represents 100% of remaining funds? No, they just completed this based on their needs at the building. So for some departments, uh, I'll give you heritage as an example. What Dan listed at heritage was pretty small. Right. And is gonna be significantly lower than what potentially would be available as a carryover for heritage. Okay. So, then so in some areas it's higher, in some it's about even, in others it's quite a bit below like heritage. So as I looked at the list, and you may not know, I saw Arboretum, Prairie, Intermediate School, Middle School, a combination of eight smart boards. Yep. And yet, then I saw 206,000 in tech for smart boards and smart board projectors. And then I saw like uh, 20 some thousand between the middle school and intermediate for band equipment. And we've got 80,000 in that potential list uh, of additional wants that we haven't addressed yet. So I'm just wondering, are there maybe crossovers there that don't have to be spent if they're going to get them or is this in addition to that? So, and I- So, so I get, I, let, let me make a comment. Uh, one of the things that, uh, I pushed for uh, this carryover because uh, when we started this, we had pianos that uh, dated back to 1968 and they couldn't, mm -hmm. they couldn't uh, repair them or they couldn't tune them anymore. And, you know, the reason that uh, this was set up and approved back then was to take care of those needs uh, that, uh, we don't put into our budget and there's generally no funds available, you know? So in your, in your face rooms, you might need stoves or refrigerators or uh, the music department with uh, pianos and, you know, those things that fall on. And, and I think looking through this, uh, you know, this uh, list of uh, topics, you know, I think we've gotten away from, that uh, 
the purpose that it was that it, that it was initially put in. You yeah. know, we've got training. You know, that training should if if we're if we're supporting PLC, we should have that in a line item in the budget, and that should come out of uh, curriculum or or wherever you know that uh, PLC should be. You know, uh, we should have specific lines in our budget for that type of stuff. We have some of it in our budget. We also have to look at like PLC and that's a good one that that has come out of building budgets for right. and combination with districts. So they can get more than seven. So it's been both. Right. going back to like your band instrument here. <laughs> The 80,000 that I put in the slide from last Thursday was from the band department chairs as they met with Steve and I last, last spring as we pulled okay. these pieces forward. And that they identified that as a as a district wide need as initial replacement, similar to like what you were talking about with like pianos to deal with right. the tubas, the baritones, some of those pieces. Now I believe that some of the dollars that you're seeing in the carryover are part of that. And when, when I well, what I articulated on Thursday night was that there would be a reallocation of dollars to the 80 grand. I was thinking out of here. It was out of some of these carryover funds that we would find the 80 right. to be able to address that and look at some of those one-time expenses that kind of help move our bar. But it doesn't have into like the 40 grand they wanted on an ongoing basis. So I would say, you know, some of them I see is, I mean, all of them are worthwhile for, for the most part. Uh, clearly, it looks like the development, the design is a huge thing with all three elementaries. And, and uh, so I, I would support them using some of those. Well, we said as a committee in the last year and previous years that I've been on this committee is that if we don't want to take money that's critical, that, that's, you know, some essential uses in the building. But if it, but we don't want we don't want them spending money just to spend it either. So my only concern here, really, from what I saw, was if there's crossover budgeting items, those could be removed and right. help go towards that eighty thousand. And I would say that a piece that we would that Steve and I would need to do with a few of these is kind of cross reference a right. few of those pieces, which we just haven't had a chance. No, to I, yeah, I recognize. But that's but the band instrument one's the easiest example. Yeah. I yeah. think there's crossover absolutely there. But aren't we uh, supporting the? Uh, if we're funding the IT hurts. I, I would suspect that the uh, uh, IT stuff would come out of Herb's budget. You know, that's uh, most of it has. I think as we look at what we've done this year, a lot of it's also come out of um, our referendum dollars as we've had to upgrade things in order to make the online environment work. So it's, it's kind of been a very much a mix of those two. As far as replacements for the tech, I, I believe, Steve, is that something that Herb has outlined as far as his replacement? Um, cycle for like the let's just use the J touches. Yeah, that's correct. I wasn't, I'm not sure if this is in a new location, maybe that doesn't currently have one, but the replacement of existing devices is a part of the technology budget. Uh, and one option that again that we could bring forward for the June committee meeting is we could bring forward recommendations for carryover amounts uh, to this committee. Because uh, again, it isn't something that has to be decided tonight as far as um, you know, whether we're gonna you know, permit Arboretum to carry over 10,000 or 20,000 or 30,000, because we're talking about something that will take place in July between fiscal years. But I do think if Randy and I had the opportunity to come back to the June committee meeting, we could share with you updated information as far as the balances and a carryover recommendation for each building and department. Uh, we would likely recommend a blend like we looked at last year, a blend yeah. between uh, carryover taking place, but also capturing some funds for use at the district level. So that would probably be the the recommendation our, on our end would be to look at what we did last year with that blend and propose something similar for this year. 
we can do a recollect or, or, or a reconciliation too between the budget request pieces and things like Herb's budget. That'd be great. That would be able to show that too. That would help. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so then, unless there's any other questions, we can move on to planning for 2021-22. Is that okay? Yep. yep. Okay, so the first item is the timeline. Just want to bring up and share with you where we're at in the process. Uh, we are at the budget committee meeting in the first week in May. At the May board meeting on May 10th, we will be presenting the first draft of the budget to the school board. We will be requesting the school board approves the 21-22 student fees, and then also takes a look at insurance benefits, uh, which Brian has on the discussion for the HR committee uh, this week. So we will then proceed with second drafts uh, and a committee meeting taking place in early June. Are there any questions at all regarding the timeline? Question. Nope. Nope. Okay, so for the next agenda item, I'm going to ask Amy Johnson for help here with this one. Uh, is Amy in person at the Bethel Circle? <laughs> yes. Okay. Is Amy, are you somewhere where people can hear you? Yes. Yes. She's okay. at her table. She's at <laughs> her table. Oh, okay. I can't see. I can't see that. Thank you. Uh, so at last month's meeting, uh, as you can recall, we were talking about class size and we were talking about uh, class size and the number of sections at the elementary school. And the committee requested that the administrative team uh, take a look at this topic again uh, and specifically take a look at the number of sections that were planned to be reduced and bring back a plan uh, that would potentially have even lower class sizes than what we had available. Uh, Amy Johnson took that on and created this document that you see in front of you. And so I'd love to just have Amy talk you through what she came up with and her conversations with the principals and what our recommendation is for tonight. So Amy, if you wanna take it from here. Yep, thank you, Steve. So um, that first table shows um, the staffing numbers that were presented at your um, April budget meeting. And if you look at that total column there, um, it shows the number of students and the number of sections and then the average class sizes. And those are all with, uh, well within our, um, our ranges. But then there were a couple of areas that if you look at the specific site, uh, we would be starting classes at um, kind of our max or even one student above. So if you scroll over, Steve, to the second um, table there, so you can see um, if we um, added a section um, or didn't reduce, um, however you want to look at it, uh, for Prairie first grade, um, that would get our ratio from 22.5 to 18. And then um, second grade heritage, if we went from five to six, um, that would change our um, ratio from 22.4 to 18.67. So that would um, allow us to start, obviously well below our um, maxes, uh, have adequate room for growth. Um, if we uh, went with the original um, proposal, we would have to start, you know, more transferring students right away if they had moved into one of those attendance areas um, that was already kind of full. So um, the initial proposal had 69 sections. This would have 71 sections, which is still one section um, lower than this year, um, but two additional from this. So take four more. Yes. Our current, uh, that first proposal of 69 was a three section reduction. Okay. So now this would be a one section okay. reduction. And how many, uh, what, is, what is our uh, board policy? So for K2, it would be 22. And for three, six, it would be 25. One of the things that you've seen happen over time, which has been really challenging to them try to reverse. So this is an opportunity to try to address class size across the elementary. 
was as we continued to grow as a district, we would add up until that max. We pretty much across the board ran at almost a maximum of our class policy for class size in every section, every grade level across the board. What's occurred at this point is we have one, some turnover in positions, retirements, et cetera. Also that year decline in enrollment has caused us to be able, instead of reducing by three sections, reduce by one, and then significantly impact the class sizes across the district and also bring each school more in congruence and, and equality with, with each other so that you don't have one that has really high classes and one that's low because that's been part of the challenge is the only other way you address that is by totally redoing these boundaries which is a piece we have to do at a point in the future but it's not a right now issue so to me this addresses the concerns we've had over time about how to get class sizes down and it's doing so by still reducing one section from where we have this year so we have 72 sections right now this knocks us down to 71 and maintains really good class sizes, which I think is also a strategy coming out of COVID as far as we're looking at intervention, et cetera. Lower class sizes is also a response to that. So that made sense as I'm, I'm looking at them, but I'm also seeing sort of a yellow light at the kindergarten level. So it, if we end up with six additional students at Prairie that puts them at that 112 level would we be looking at adding another section there too and or do we look at to because that would put them over 22 for kindergarten which seems quite a bit over because the be five, so if you had if you added six kids you, you'd still be at no we, we would still be all right Mark and I okay. think that would be um we we were we're still a number of kids below that 22. We're actually hitting our optimal numbers, which is something that we haven't done okay. probably in my time here. It's hit optimal across okay. the board, which right. I think is what has really been an objective in a conversation we've talked about. There just wasn't a pathway to get there. So from my perspective, this gives us that ability okay. to do it. And then as we continue to grow, obviously we'll have to address that with our facility growth plan, but this gives us an option. And Joan, do you remember at last month's meeting, you had commented how you liked the way we had the information presented for the current year, but wanted to see a chart just like the one that Amy created for 2122. Is that what you were referring to? And would you like to see something like this included in our process from now on moving forward? I like it presented this way. I think it creates a clearer picture of where, you know, where our class sizes are throughout the district. I appreciate that, Steve. And ideally, K-12. Yeah, I would like to see more clarification at those next levels as well. Okay. Amy, did you have anything else to add? Thank you so much. Can I ask one question? When I look at heritage fourth grade, um, you know, in comparison to everything else, it is considerably lower. Have you thought about grade four? And so that was intentional based on some oh, identified students. Okay, I get it. Sure. You know more right. about that then. That's perfect. Yep, and I think that was actually part of even last month's discussion was we still had another additional section there just to address some individual needs. Okay, good. good to do that. And just for the committee's information, uh, the work that Amy did on the chart to the right with the 71 sections, that is what we included in the first draft of the budget, which is the next agenda item. Uh, so just note that the chart to the right is the one that we included in the first draft. The chart to the left was the one that we had included in the planning process. So the first draft of the budget does include the 71 sections uh, for grades K through four. It also continues the, the number of sections we had identified at last month's meeting for fifth and sixth grade. And the first draft now includes 
the staffing, what's called the shared staffing uh, between the schools and the middle school, high school staffing uh, as well. And I can talk about that for a moment because the committee asked for information on grades, you know, on, on all the district grades. And so if, you, if you've if you got a moment, um, I just wanted to share with you uh, that the, the FTE information for the entire district is included in the first draft on page 13, which specifically identifies all of the positions. Those are the positions that came out of Brian's meetings with the principals for positions that they were requesting for next school year based on class size and student schedules. I'm gonna pull that up real quick, but Brian, do you wanna comment at all regarding those conversations and the request that, that you had and what led to that information for uh, class sizes and FTE changes? Um, I guess the, probably the most noticeable item uh, that you'll see there is the shift of, of two staff, two positions, two FTE from the intermediate school to the middle school. Uh, that, that's in response to the seventh grade class being uh, comparatively large to, to other grades. Um, and then I guess the some of the other uh, changes that you'll see there um, are, are, you know, there is uh, in general uh, an increase in music staffing in, across the district. That 0.17 is a is an additional or is additional FTE across the district. Um, there, you know, beyond that, uh, the you know the net result is is uh, fairly minimal in terms of staffing changes across the district. With uh, with a little bit of shifting, uh, that that's necessary. So there, you know, there is uh, even though there's very few positions on this page, there is staffing. Uh, there were changes within buildings, and there were changes across buildings. I have to ask. Yeah. <laughs> how do you get a point zero two FTE yeah. for a French teacher? Ah, uh, that's a travel. Uh, that was a travel overload. Okay. So that, that person gets to their gets to the to the minutes. So they're not traveling this way. Yeah. So yeah, correct. Yep. So less <laughs> less sharing, less sharing needed. But yes, yeah, so they get to their minutes it cap. So weird. Yep, they get to their minutes cap, and then uh, every we have uh, identified the number of minutes allotted between yeah. all of our buildings, and you just add the, the amount of travel minutes to whatever they're teaching. Does a point one seven make it a full time position? Uh, closer to a full time okay. position. Not, that's not quite. Yeah. Otherwise. Yep. It's it's not. Uh, I don't recall exactly what the percentages mark. It's it's closer to full time. It's not yet full time. Thank you. Um, the business ed is uh, additional time. Uh, agriculture is additional time. Um, the uh, the business ed will require an external hire, um, and so we're we're likely going to have to boost that to a, a at least a half time position to have a chance to find someone. Mm -hmm. Um, the agriculture position, for example, is just a, will be an overload for staff person that we currently have. Uh, and, and then the uh, FIAD position, for example, is uh, it is still going to it's going down by 33.33, uh, but we'll still have a 0.33. So we'll likely have to hire that at a half time also to find someone, but we'll attempt to do that. Um, as the summer goes on, those will be challenging hires for sure. Um, but hopeful, uh, we'll see what the market will give us. Brian, when we reduce sixth grade by two staff members, is that going to occur through resignation to retirement? Uh, a resignation and a, a, a movement. So uh, somebody will actually move from sixth grade to, to, to fifth grade. To yeah. fifth grade within yeah. the not yeah, within the building. Yeah, right. Within so the there was a retirement end of it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So and then a rebound. Nobody's losing a job. No. At the intermediate. Or moving to a different school. Or no. moving no. to a different it's, school. It's through attrition and it's through. Okay. Yeah. So then when you um, hire two at the middle school, because of the difference, they'll just. They'll be brand brand new to us. Uh, coming from you know out in the, the, the teaching market, okay. um, and and when we have those hire those types of positions, it's been quite a while I guess since we've done that. 
uh, they'll have a dual focus. Uh, so they, you know, we'll hire a person that's a math science focus. Oh, I get it. Yeah, and we'll hire a person that's uh, and social studies to, and yeah. uh, and at that grade level, they focus. can do that. Yeah, and so with that certification within our typical teams, right? There, you know, the teams of four. Each right. person has a subject area focus. These folks that we'll hire will, will have to kind of dabble in two worlds. Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. Complicated. Yeah, well, it, it's you know certainly within the K eight licensure. Right. I mean, that's right. you know so within the realm of possible. Yeah. But it it allows us to dictate that that's the type of license we need to see. All right. Thank you. Thank you. What do we need to uh, do there? Uh, we don't need any action item. Any action on this? I'll just move on to uh, okay. the first draft. Then, uh, okay. is there any other questions on class sizes or FTE? Okay, if not, I'm going to just talk for a moment about the high, highest level uh, information on the 21-22 budget. Um, if, you, if you look at the notes that you would see here, I just wanna cover what the basis of the budget is. Uh, first of all, the budget committee identified parameters for budget planning because we know we're in a state budget year yet we don't know the resources that are gonna be available to schools. So as a reminder, the governor has proposed a $200 per student increase in the revenue, revenue limit formula. We're currently using $150. So that means our projections and our planning is probably best viewed as on the conservative end if the governor's budget proposal ends up being a $200 increase per student, uh, then additional resources will be available depending on our student count this fall. An increase in the special ed categorical aid to 35%, uh, the governor has proposed a significantly higher increase than 35%, uh, but we're planning right now for our purposes an increase to 35%. The salary increase is projected at 3.06%. Uh, Brian is going to be reviewing uh, this information with the HR committee later this week. Uh, but keep in mind that we do have a 3.06% increase identified in the budget for salaries at this point, with no increases planned in either health or dental rates. We are continuing the second year of expending funds out of the capital maintenance projects fund 41. Uh, we just took a look at the overall FTE increases included in the first draft of the budget, which is identified in page 13. And then we're gonna come back in a, in a separate agenda item and discuss additional budget requests uh, that we have available at this time. So that's a high level what's included in the first draft of the budget at this time, primarily based on estimates that the committee was comfortable with and approved at previous meetings, as well as FTE changes and the salary increases at 3.06%. Do any committee members have any questions about, about that information? Questions? Move on to the next item, I guess. If not, we'll just move through some subcategories of the 21-22 budget. Uh, the student fees are presented to the budget committee at the May uh, meeting, and then we do ask for recommendations to move this forward to the school board at the May board meeting. Uh, you can see two columns where we're at in 2020-2021 and what we're recommending for next year. Uh, as you can see there, we, we're not recommending increases in our student fees at this time. Um, if you, if I'll scroll down and just share the one request that we did get from the high school was to move to, I'll go down to uh, transcripts. The high school is looking to move to a flat $15 fee for transcripts and a student can request as many as they want compared to $6 for the initial transcript and then $3 for
for each transcript thereafter. Um, the high school believes it's a better situation for both the guidance department and students to just collect a single payment up front of 15, and then the students can request as many copies as they want, apply it as many colleges as they want, and then they will not have to pay. Um, the, the guidance department is requesting not continuing to collect $3 every time a student needs a transcript and believes that this is a much more effective way of, of transcript fees moving forward. Other than that, we did ask each of the buildings if they had any requests for changes, and that was the only one that we received. We'll move, we accept this. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes. Okay, thank you. The next item is the facility use fees. And we did reach out to Aaron and his department for any recommendations for changes. And you will see that the soccer stadium has been added to the same line as Warrior Stadium uh, for the fee structure. Um, so that would be on that top line uh, where Aaron wants to charge the same amount uh, for the soccer stadium as, as is being charged for the Warrior Stadium. Uh, that is the only recommended change that Aaron had at this time. Uh, any questions or comments from the committee? Okay, so it's actually going to be the same dollar value for the football. It's not listed that way, but that's what's supposed to be, correct? Yep. Okay. Could I request when we put this in board books for, you know, we have a number of people in the committee that look at it, that we define the groups. Can we have a little description of group one, two, three, four, five, six? Sure. Thank you. There's a document with that that we can include. Yeah, um, I just think it would be good for the public to know yeah. what the groups are. We just need to make that other team fix up for them. Hey Steve, quick question: uh, With Warrior Stadium, uh, are are they on track with uh, raising the money to uh, replace the uh, turf? So we have been setting aside thirty thousand per year in a separate account on the district end to replace the turf at Warrior Stadium. So we've we've done that twice now and this will be the third year that we've done it so yes we are going to be on track for the replacement of the turf at warrior stadium uh, because we are setting aside that thirty thousand dollars per year uh, the board made a recommendation to set aside the first thirty thousand from gate receipts towards future replacement of turf and administratively we've been moving that thirty thousand dollars every year into a separate fund balance account that's separated out and held just for that particular purpose. We are assuming uh, that the board is interested in doing the exact same thing for the soccer stadium. So that would be the first year that we would be doing the soccer stadium would be this year as well. So we'd be putting aside funds for both of them at the end of this fiscal year. Are, are they uh, still raising money uh, for the uh, replacement of the uh, turf? So we are we are continually drawing the funds from the Wanaki Area Education Foundation. So we're in contact with Tasha Tasha Chambers, who lets us know the amount of funds that they've raised and have deposited into their accounts. And then we pull it out of the WAIF accounts into the district accounts at least once per year. Uh, so we're currently looking at doing that in the next week or so because we do have their balances and we are requesting that those funds be transferred from WAIF to the district. So every year we are continuing to pull all of those funds out uh, and putting them back into our accounts. And what are those? Uh, do you have those balances or? I can get them to you. Yep. Yeah, great. I'll, I'll write myself a note. Anything else? 
we'd be looking for a motion to bring this forward to the full board on May 10th. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes. Okay, so the next agenda item is our food service fund, fund 50. Uh, we do have some, we do have a budget that is being recommended by Taher uh, for the next school year. A couple of things to note, uh, Taher is recommending uh, no increase in student fees. Uh, that is, that recommendation is just based on where our lunch fees are at compared to other districts in the area, as well as the fact that we do have a budget. I can go to page two here. Uh, that is that has a small positive balance of about thirty thousand dollars that we are able to have without an increase in student fees. I think the biggest question for this committee is really regarding the fact that there's no longer a fund balance in fund 50 uh, and that is the committee comfortable with us targeting a $30,000 uh, profit level next year and not increasing student fees or is the committee looking to increase student fees so that we would have a, a larger buffer as we move forward. Um, you can see here in the letter from Taher, every 10 cent increase would generate about $21,000 in additional surplus and fund 50. So really this is, a, this is something where we're looking for feedback on the committee. We can move forward with the budget that's attached that has no increase and has an estimated positive balance of around 30,000 or the committee could recommend an increase and every 10 cents in an increase generates a little over $20,000 in additional funds. Steve, year before pandemic, I, I don't recall how we turned out. Uh, were we pretty much at a break even point in uh, the 1920s? We still, we had a deficit in 1920 because we were, prior to uh, the pandemic, the board had a goal of paying for equipment from Fund 50 out of Fund 50, paying for maintenance costs out right. of Fund 50, paying for technology. So whenever those items came about, we would pay for them out of our Fund 50 balance. And in the 1920 year, we did pull down our balance by a bit because of the expense the equipment expenditures we had that year. But prior to the pandemic, we were near $300,000 in our positive balance and fund 50, which did allow the district to purchase ovens and dishwashers. But as of right now, we do, we no longer have a balance and fund 50. So if a dishwasher needed to be replaced, it would have to come through John Kramer's capital project list because there's no funds remaining in the food service budget to be able to do that. With, with uh, food and everything going up, are these uh, prices realistic? The prices would be realistic if the, if the committee is comfortable with targeting a, a profit <laughs> level or a surplus of 30,000. If the committee would like to see expenditures like equipment and maintenance charged again to the food service fund, I would say additional resources would be needed and, and a, a meal price increase would be appropriate in that regard. It just depends on whether this committee is comfortable with John Kramer's budget continuing to replace the equipment for food service or whether the committee would like to see the food service fund itself go back to being able to cover those type of expenses. I think one of the things that we've been talking about uh, in the last couple of years is kind of realigning and get, getting back to uh, where we were pre-pandemic. And I would submit that uh, raising prices, you know, to uh, build up that fund again so that we can work the way we were 
you know, would be appropriate. Are you suggesting like a 10 cent increase debt? 10, 10 cent increase. So, because I think then what happens over, you know, several years is that now, you know, it's going to take us a while to get there. Uh, but I think having that dedicated fund to, to uh, you know, the uh, food service, you know, takes away from other budget pressures. Is this oh, is motion idea. Specifically, Steve? We would just be looking for a motion from the committee on bringing forward uh, food service fees for the next school year, either the budget that's presented or a 10 cent increase, and then we'll bring that forward to the May board meeting. So it would be a 10 cents just on the main meals, not the breakfast, not on every item here? That's correct. Yep. Just the main meal. This was probably my wonder. I, the budget's low at thirty thousand, but you know, if our goal is to go back to the model where we're sustaining equipment through the program, you know, I, we're going to have to do something like that. Um, I think if uh, I mean, I would support the ten cent raise for the idea of moving in that direction, but I. I as a committee, I think we have to voice if that's a, a recommendation to the board as a whole. Does the board want us to do that? Well, I think what happens is, uh, you know, we've had a pretty effective uh, food service program with uh, good equipment, uh, things yep. like that. And now you put it into uh, John Kramer's budget. And do we need a dishwasher or do we need that window or do we need yep. the roof? You know, this way, You've got some dedicated funds that uh, go yep. towards, uh, and like I say, it's not going to happen in one year. No, uh, but I think if we go in that direction, it's going to support and get us back aligned with where we were in the past. Yeah, I can support that. I can support that. So, who's making the motion? I'll make the motion. We increase by ten cents. And oh. Yep, I second that. With the idea of building up the pump. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank Aye. you. I'll jump into the next topic, which is Fund 41. Uh, so I'd like to just share some information regarding Fund 41 and the topic of the Moody's credit report, which we're going to bring forward at the next meeting. These two topics are closely connected. What I'd like to do, if the committee's okay with it, is move on to the budget requests. And if time permits before the meeting adjourns at 6.30, we can come back to this topic. If not, the topic of Fund 41 and the Moody's credit report will come back to the June committee meeting. Is everybody okay with that? Good yes. idea. Yeah. Okay. So I'll move forward to the budget requests. Uh, so I'm going to open up one of the slides that we had available last Thursday night. And what this slide has is the alignment of budget requests with school board priorities. Uh, and so you were able to see this last Thursday during the special board meeting. Uh, these are the requests uh, that in our initial review are very closely aligned with the school board's goals and priorities. These particular requests will need funding uh, between the first draft of the budget and the second draft of the budget if the committee gives the administrative team uh, approval to move forward with posting these positions then we would move forward with seeking funding options for these positions. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about federal funding and the operational referendum question, but I first wanna see if Randy has anything that he wants to share in addition to what he shared already about this particular slide last Thursday night. 
Um, thanks, Steve. I think all I wanted to share here was this was really brought forward as I met with Kurt and Chris and and Tim and Amy at, at really our central office level. We reviewed all of the requests district wide. We looked at the ones that were coming out of the um, out of the buildings. Looked at the items that were kind of most impactful. I, I made a list of what I thought lined up with um, the board's priority list. And then we talked about other items that we felt fit within this vision um, just through how they impacted other staff. So for example, the high school testing and online support person, right now that's all done by our counselors. Our thought was if we can create that and move all of that off for our counselors, it gives them more opportunity to work directly with our students. And so that's an example of that. Um, you see the two items that are really one-time funds with the, the branding piece and the equipment. Those are things that I would see through kind of the, as you pointed out, Mark, through uh, carryover funds. Um, otherwise, these were the ones that, that I was presenting as far as kind of the high level items. I know as I went through and I shared with you the notes from each of the breakouts, there were a few others related to like the science coordinator, some professional development, associate principal at Arboretum, um, pathways, a couple others that did make it into some of the discussions and a few of the um, breakout sessions. But I think generally from at least my read through was these were ones that were supported at least from, from the conversations within our, our breakouts. And I think represent some of our highest needs, particularly as they've listened to the board talk about how do we move forward post COVID. These resonated with the group I was with particularly I mean, almost unanimously supportive. Um, and then there's also a suggestion with the elementary tech integrationists, if we're going to get that, to revisit the six day rotation and maybe relieve the counselors of some of that responsibility to also get them at that level more in the mental health support as well. So maybe we have some tech teaching, some counseling teaching, but it, would, it wouldn't be just a tech benefit, then it would be mental health benefit as well. So I mean, that, that's definitely stuff. been a consideration. And, and those tech folks, we have them at all, the, all of the other levels. We don't have an elementary person. This right. is kind of envisioned as at a minimum of one. And if you're looking at it as we kind of work through with trying to figure out how can we free up some additional, like let's use the example of counselor time that really was, let's got some additional flushing out to make happen. Then you need at the upper end of this in order to make that occur. But definitely there's, we have a lot of tech, we have a lot of things that we're supporting and we have families that we're supporting with it as well. So it, it's definitely a growing and a continual and, a, and an ongoing need that we'll have. With school psych, it looks like it's a combination of special ed funding and our budget because it's a kind of a split responsibility. Because we're able to hire a school psych, there's a level of, of categorical aid that can come with it. Um, so there's some pieces of the money that will come back. We pit, that was actually two requests. One was for a school site, one was for a 504 coordinator. And we decided at this point we could connect those and have the school site really be the 504 coordinator and then also provide other services. And that, that comes with the categorical aid. I guess one of the things is I was sitting through those, that meeting and I thought uh, we were talking about one-time expenses because we had uh, and you know when I when I look at this, the only thing that's a one-time expense is uh, branding, branding and the music. And those are the only. The other ones are ongoing. So as yeah. the others are ongoing, you know, correct. If if the uh, five-year referendum doesn't pass, uh, you know, what do what do we do? You know, and that's part of why. I mean, if you look at it. That's going to be the conversation we have to have, Jack, is that we're either going to have to find over the course of the next four years, the four hundred and whatever thirty thousand dollars, half million dollars, and build that into the budget moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, these are requests that absolutely help us as we come out of COVID, but they're absolutely requests that would that are going to be there post COVID too. And they're going to be these are requests that came in even prior to this. I've just prioritized them forward. So we're going to have to make some decisions as far as how do we find those dollars moving forward. You either are going to have to build them into subsequent budgets 
or you're going to have to, as you get to the end of that point, you're going to have to make a decision as far as what we're funding and is there additional referendum funds that needs to sustain some of the programs moving forward that you value. And that, that's kind of the reality of it. You know, I guess what I'd like to see is, uh, you know, staffing versus student population in a, a, a chart like that, because you, you know, basically, you know, we've, uh, We've been at about 4,500 to 4,700. Uh, our large classes are, are going through. Right. The classes coming in are, are not making up those right. numbers. You know, basically, what we're going to do is approve nine new positions here. That's what it, that's what it presents, yeah. And what it does, though, so, so for example, heritage in the case of interventions. Decrease the equity in the buildings that they all have the share that they all have the same number of interventionists where they're sharing right now. Oh, okay. and the share of reading and interventions between buildings is dysfunctional. Uh, and so, I mean, the same thing with the high school testing. Uh, we're trying to free counselors up so they can counsel, not spend a third of their time doing the standardized testing. And so that gets into the mental health piece. So, from my end, I would support all of these with the idea that we have short term, we have it. When we were looking at an operational referendum to go with the facilities referendum, we were looking at program cost expansion too. We weren't just looking at bricks and mortar uh, or, or operational cost expenses for the brick and mortar. So that, that may be a partial response to it when we get down the road. But from my perspective, we have the resources for the next four years. We've got time to find a blended way to carry this cost and expand our program in a way to create equity in multiple buildings uh, at the highest levels of need. Well, I think one of the things that uh, came out in our session was uh, one of the people I forget her name was uh, talking about PLC and how that, you know, strengthening the uh, PLC. Yeah you know, is more important than the intervention is because you get a better program for everybody. I think there's anyone that got that value. I, I think it's both. I think it's it's the PLC absolutely strengthens our universal curriculum. And it strengthens our ability to be able to have four of us are teaching together, making sure that we're doing this and we're 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 building off of each other. I think that that's the benefit of the PLC. The intervention nests are, are definitely pieces that we're continuing to um, see is how do you continue to move kids forward who are not at some of those levels. And, and that's a that's a piece that's absolutely a, a growing need and also a growing instructional approach to help move kids forward and to keep the achievement at the level that we are expecting. Randy, um, I would be really interested to know how the interventionists are used at those primary levels. I, I mean, I don't think they pull out kids, do they? Do they go in and co-teach? Do they do a combination? I'm curious what their job looks like. All right, no, we can do that. I'll make sure we have that for Monday. Okay. Yeah, it's different if this isn't an instructional coach. So this yeah, is an I, actual I, intervention. This they work with kids, kids, but I'd like to know when and how yep. and where. We'll get that. Would anybody have any additional questions for Randy on this? Otherwise, I just want to. I guess, Steve, just one. How do we put metrics on this to say that the, what we're doing is working? You know, uh, yeah, we can, th this all sounds great, but how do we, how do we know, you know, what what can you bring back to the board and say, geez, you know, because we we put this half million dollars into uh, the budget and put the put the staff on, you know, this is the this these are the improvements that are happening. I mean, part of this is going to be watching the growth that you have in the students. I mean, that, that's the data you look at. So if you're looking at a math or a reading interventionist, we do a formative and some of the assessments throughout the year that really start to track how our kids are doing. Kids that are being used for interventions and 
and Ted was part of the group there that I was in in the breakout, and they said, well, utilizing the information you get from the universal curriculum and universal assessment, will that help to identify some of the students that would then receive intervention? And that's, and that's part of the piece, is that you're looking for the, how are your students performing, finding that, that tier of kids who need some additional intervention. The piece you're looking for is how are those kids growing? So that's part of what you see, like when Amy Johnson pre presents to the board of, of where kids started and where they ended as far as moving towards their um, grade level targets. But yeah, we can definitely put metrics to some of the intervention pieces. A um, little cautious as to how we do it with individual kids if we've got confidentiality, but we can generally show is there growth happening through intervention. Oh, and how many more kids are they serving? Right. <clears throat> Well, so if, yeah. you, if you put an intervention this next year, yeah. uh, that's putting more resources. You know, the following year, you would expect that uh, you get uh, a check. You would, you'll see a girl, you'll see girls throughout the year, even next year, hopefully, yeah. because you're going to have kids, there are kids this year who aren't getting one on one help. Okay, the intervention is, let's think of it as a small group, you know. I'll bring your question back, but an interventionist could be somebody in the classroom. It can also be if someone who's working with me to help move me forward. So if I was targeted as a student who needed intervention, there would be work that could happen with me that you can then track to see how they're improving. And to your point, Jack, it, it, it's a fair one as far as where does the dollars come from? Because you see on the very first part that Steve presented, once you you address any of the things that we're working on from the from the salary end and any other roll-ups this year given kind of the i guess the conservative approach we took to our budget parameters all the dollars are gone and so as we start to look at how do you move kind of forward with some of the things and i read our, our priorities being around intervention and trying to help the student piece that's where these come from so they, they have to come out of those additional dollars, be it ESSER money or out of the referendum funds. And then part of what our work is, is then how do you move them forward, sustain them in years coming? My hope is that the state, that either the state budget or our enrollment have an impact in the fall and some additional dollars that help with that. Yeah. It's all of our hopes. So do we, this is just moving yeah. forward. We don't need any kind of motion from us to move to our board. So basically, Steve, how do you have this in the first draft of the budget? Do you have these items as, as a is, separate piece? These items were discussion tonight with looking for a motion from this committee to recommend the addition of these positions into the first draft of the budget so that we would be able to move forward with the posting. Uh, so we were looking for some recommendation from the committee tonight regarding moving forward with uh, the information included on the slide. And to Randy's point, the one-time expenditures for the branding and the music equipment, uh, we are looking at the carryover funds for those particular expenditures. So we'd be looking for a recommendation from this committee regarding the three uh, positions on the left-hand side underneath the district branding, and then on the right-hand side, the four, uh, not positions, but the bullet points, and on the right-hand side, the top four. Um, so we'd be looking to exclude the, the ones that we would be taking care of from the carryover funds. Uh, so we're looking for a recommendation from this committee to the board next Monday night. And also, I mean, I know there's a few questions that have arisen about some of the positions. If there's things that you want specifically, I mean, this could be, there's multiple ways you could do this. You could divert this to the full board with wanting more information, which we report on on Monday, and then having the action take place at the full board, you could make a motion of, of some level tonight to move it forward as Steve is asking. If we move, we move the bullets identified with the exception of the first and the last uh, with the request to have additional information to the board Monday night. Fair enough. I would second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm going to vote no. Okay. 
just for clarification, what I've heard from you is one, just talking about kind of the when, how, where, the definition of the interventionist pieces. And then we're also what I heard from you, Jack, is as we look at intervention, what are some metrics that show growth? Is that yes. what you would say? Any other questions regarding them? So in the uh, TAP specialist, are we looking at three? Well, I think that's, I think we, if, if we're looking at that item, but you need a minimum of one, because that would be someone I would assign to the elementary level. I think three is kind of the, that that's saturating it where you have one per building. And when you look at right now, we have one at the middle school, one at the high, we have one at the intermediate, one at the middle school, and I believe one at the high school. Is that right, Brian? Correct. So when you kind of look at it from an NFTE piece, you're looking at it either two to four grades per first. So to me, it's probably, a, a, if I had to pick a number right now to start with, I'd probably say two. So I'm, I'm trying to understand how tech integration specialist works. Is it is it a class? Is it? Uh, it, it can be. It, 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 or it's what, what is the plan? Right. The plan with those folks are is they're working with the, the teachers as far as how do you maximize the use of your technology to work with the kids. They're helping to put together um, some of the lessons that are more tech involved. If you go to like uh, intermediate school, they actually will they'll come in and help classes with different projects. So a lot of the things that you see at those levels, you have um, individuals who are helping within the classroom to further enhance how we're utilizing technology. So that's just been, and as we kind of have, have expanded how we use it, that's been a very vital, vital position highly sought after and highly utilized by our staff at all those levels and definitely been a piece that our elementary folks have felt has been a bit lacking. And actually, I mean, this year, from my understanding, at the elementary level, the principals actually had to do a lot of the troubleshooting on tech problems because they had no one to vote. So their full from their job was at the intermediate school and the Fox came back. Yeah. Well, let, let me bring some additional information to help clarify yep. that really too, so we can present that to the full board. Okay, we've got uh, nine minutes uh, left here, uh, Steve. Okay, so the next topic is uh, review estimated salary increases. I just wanted to share that uh, first payroll of the next fiscal year is July 15th. We do have employee groups receiving paychecks on July 15th, admin, admin support, administrative assistance, custodial maintenance. Uh, Brian is working with the HR committee on May 6th regarding the topic of providing pay increases uh, for the July 15th for those groups instead of waiting until the fall. A recent past practice has been to provide those pay increases in the Oct in the November-ish time frame after the budget was finalized at the end of October. There has been increasing interest in recent years to moving that process back to uh, the first payroll of the year. I wanted to make sure this committee was aware that those conversations will be taking place this week with the HR committee. And it is possible that the HR committee may be making recommendations to the May 10th board meeting to move forward with pay increases uh, at the beginning of the fiscal year. I did include in your packet information uh, prepared by uh, Brian and his team regarding uh, at a high level what some of this information is looking like for the HR committee meeting. Uh, so I wanted to make sure this committee knew about that conversation, knew that the HR committee might be making recommendations next Monday night to move forward with pay increases, and that you could have information as to how that fits in to the larger picture of the 3.06% in total that is being included in the first 
bootstrap to the budget. Brian, do you have any you know high level highlights that you want to share with the budget committee regarding uh, this topic that you're going to be reviewing with the HR committee uh, this week? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, uh, what we'll be talking about with the HR committee is a proposal to uh, set the wage uh, packages for five or six employee groups at this time uh, with, an, uh, with an eye on the sixth group. And so the, we'll start with what's not there. As you look at this, this uh, page that Steve had shared, what is not uh, included is the teacher aspect of it. Um, then the teacher aspect has two components to it. There's the base wage, which we negotiate, uh, which is limited to the CPI amount, which is known, and there's supplemental wages, which uh, is determined by the employer. Um, we will include kind of ideas with, within that to, to match with what the other employee groups are getting. Um, but as I kind of referred to before, uh, we have, because of the transition uh, within the True, within the hourly employment groups to true time, we do want to have those wages set, settled, and correct. Uh, and so that would include the proposal for, for those three hourly groups, which are classified staff, which would include our paraeducating group, paraeducators, our, uh, and cr crossing guards. They're just broken out because it's kind of a unique group. Custodial maintenance, uh, which are, uh, and then finally, administrative assistance. And actually, the size of those groups is in uh, decreasing size. So largest is classified hourly group, second largest custodial maintenance, third largest uh, administrative assistance. And then in addition, because we have followed the practice of uh, traditionally offering admin and admin support, the, the package increase, uh, the percentage package increase of the other groups, uh, you know, we're able to toss that out as 12 month employees as well. So we propose the, those five groups moving forward. Um, and I guess uh, what I had mentioned, as I mentioned before, uh, the idea within our hourly employment groups, uh, some, some either positions that we've had uh, challenges filling uh, or those that have an interplay, uh, you know, for example, head custodian, custodian, you can't realistically adjust the custodial wage scale without doing some corresponding work to the head custodian scale because of their interrelationship. Uh, for example, within classified staff, that same uh, action would be in place. If we're adjusting our regular paraeducator scale, we need to adjust our special educator paraeducator scale because we have you know, uh, levels of, of job classifications within it. And it even related to that is our health assistants are interconnected to, to our paraeducators and special ed paraeducators. So, We've got to try to position those to keep uh, how we've looked at and viewed those positions consistently. So there's a, a targeted raises going to those different groups. So Brian, at a high level, we're sharing with the HR committee the concept of a 2% adjustment across to yeah. across the board increase, movement across the salary schedule that the board approved last fall and targeted increases uh, to address areas of concern. But fundamentally, that's really at a high level, the, the draft proposal that's being presented uh, to the HR committee, correct? Correct. Do any budget committee members have any questions regarding uh, this information or regarding what Brian is going to be presenting uh, later this week to the HR committee? Why are we leaving out the uh, teachers in this group? Well, because we, we have to set negotiations with them, uh, Jack, and what, what we can and what I will include in the information that I provide to the HR committee is uh, if we were looking at a CPI increase and, uh, and uh, we had talked earlier this spring about uh, an anticipated points increase of or supplemental pay of $600 uh, due to points. Uh, I, I will include that as part of the picture, uh, but we can't say that that's resolved or settle that until we open negotiations. So what do you need on this, Steve? Uh, is it just information? Just information. 
And the the next agenda item is just, just so you can see a report as to where we are currently sitting with the operational referendum funds. Uh, basically, we continue to uh, expend uh, the funds in the operational referendum. Uh, we do have starting to receive requests. Uh, so the funds for this current fiscal year are primarily allocated. We do have in the board book an attachment from the uh, maintenance department regarding requests for consideration for the 21-22 school year. Uh, so there's a column that says 21-22. Uh, we really don't have the time tonight to really jump into this. So I will bring this agenda item back at the next meeting, but please note that we are having those conversations regarding any potential uh, COVID related health or safety expenditures that we would like to see considered for the operational referendum funds, but we can bring this information back to the next meeting. And then we also would like to have agenda items at the next meeting regarding our actuarial study and fund 73, and then the Moody's credit opinion and our fund 41, and then the second draft of the budget as well. Uh, so all of those items we would like to bring back at the June committee meeting. You guys all agree? Yeah. Yep. And then you're gonna bring the uh, football field information on fundraising to that meeting too? Absolutely, I can add that to that agenda, yep. Good. Okay, anything other, anything else? Other than that, we just would request adjournment before the facility committee Motion meeting. To Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.